Our final presentation is not a formal talk, but a conversation with Philip Auslander, who is professor in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. I'm sure many in the audience are familiar with his boundary-breaking work on performance across art, music, and beyond. Uh, and today we have Phil, an expert on liveness and mediation, uh, both live and mediated with us to answer our and your questions. Uh, Emily, Hannah, and myself will begin the discussion, but please do put your questions and thoughts in the chat and Q&A, and we'll be sure to incorporate them into the conversation. So Phil, thank you so much for agreeing to discuss liveness live with us. Uh, someone turned off my video. Can I have it back? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. There you are. Ah, nice to see you. There I am. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, no, well, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Nice to be here. So I'd like to begin by <clears throat> um, asking about, uh, so you've argued that the, the documentation of performance is not necessarily just a, a pale echo of the live act, as is sometimes assumed, uh, but itself participates in the performative. Uh, the argument has been really very influential and uh, not just to our own work, but for so many who write, do, and think about performance. So perhaps you could begin by summarizing your ideas on the possibilities of performance documentation. Okay. Um, thank you for warning me <laughs> that this was going to be the first question. Um, I think the the most straightforward way. Well, actually, let me let me start with just a little bit of context, okay? Um, and the bits of context have to do with really two things. One was a bunch of years ago, I was invited to a sort of symposium or a conference around the idea of art as research uh, in the academic context and performance in particular, obviously. And what I felt at that event, this was in the UK, and what I felt at that event was this sort of incredible anxiety around the idea that in order to get a doctorate in you know, performance as research, you had to make performance work and then you had to find a way of documenting it as part of your dissertation, essentially. Incredible anxiety over this prospect of having to document the work and how this was you know, ultimately probably an impossible task that the documentation could never you know, somehow uh, correctly or accurately convey the performance. And I just myself kind of felt like maybe this anxiety was a little bit misplaced. Um, and the sort of other part of that was just thinking about, and in very, very simple pragmatic terms, just thinking about how we actually think about documentation. When I say we, I mean scholars and you know, people are interested. Although, you know, it is an important point to me to stress that a lot of these questions of documentation and experiencing performances from documentation are not in any way specific to the art world, right? I mean, Rebecca Schneider, for example, has talked about Civil War reenactors. Uh, I talk a lot about music and musicians. Um, and so a lot of these same issues are, are prevalent in, in all, all contexts, essentially, in which people partake of recorded or documented performances. And in all cases, and, and again, I was really thinking primarily about myself as a scholar, as someone who's, or a teacher, you know, if I, if I want to uh, present a performance uh, to my students, or if I want some information about a performance that I haven't actually seen, what do I do, right? I look for documentation. And when I use this documentation in whatever form it is, whether it's photographic or, you know, time-based or whatever, I do not go into it with the assumption that I can't get any real information about the performance from the documentation. In fact, I think we all go into it with exactly the opposite assumption, that whatever we see in the documentation is somehow giving us some real information about what that performance was, right? And so I think we simply need to recognize that and let go of all of the sort of anxiety about the inadequacy of documentation. Now, that said, I think uh, my, the, the simplest summary I can give of my position on all this is that what I've been trying to do is essentially to sever the ontological connection between the document and the performance. 
in favor of a view, in other words, not seeing, you know, not seeing those two things as dependent on one another. Uh, either documentation is dependent on it, the originary performance or that there's a kind of mutual dependence, right? But rather to see a live performance and its documentation as different iterations of the same work from which an experience of that work can be had in either case. That's, 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 my, that's the, the, the most straightforward version <laughs> of um, what I, uh, where I'm coming from. Um, and I, as I, you know, since you, again, since you warned me, I took a moment to look at my own book, Reactivation, so I can remember what I think. Um, see, I need documentation of my own ideas. Um, and so at the end of, the, of one of the chat, the first chapter of this book, um, which is a, an essay uh, based on an essay called The Performativity of Performance Documentation, I make the point that perhaps you know, in sort of philosophical terms, what's of much greater interest to me than an ostensible ontological connection between the document and the performance is a phenomenological connection between the document and the audience for the document and how the audience for the document ex somehow experiences that performance from it, because that clearly is a process that is happening. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, can I jump in and ask you about the relationship between um, documentation and conservation? Because for a long time, conservators have been conserving performance as documentation, and conservators are also producing documentation. So in your view, what are the differences and relationship between conserving and documenting? Right, well, I, I, I... I've been trying to sort of sort out all of these different terms, documentation, conservation, uh, et cetera. And I think that, I mean, for me, the documentation should be seen as sort of the raw material from which uh, a hypothetical performance conservator would be working. Uh, so, you know, to me, the, 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 the documentation of the performance is kind of the primary material. And then what I imagine conservators uh, doing um, is, is more of an act is, of uh, reconstruction of the performance rather than simply documenting the performance. Uh, but of course that reconstruction would take place from the available data, which would be, you know, uh, documentation. Um, so, so for me, the, the documentation is kind of the raw material um, that conservators uh, would have to work with uh, in, the, in, what, uh, in what they do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. I'm going to jump in now with, uh, with a question actually related to something you have already said, and obviously which is present um, in, such a, in such a wonderful, um, uh, wonderfully articulated way in your writings. Um, you know, you said in an earlier conversation that you don't understand documentation as conservation, but rather as a precondition, right? Um, uh, as a precondition for conservation. Um, you believe that documentation is not necessarily only created before or during performance, right? But um, also can be created after the fact. Um, and there is, you know, there is on the one hand, this uh, kind of, um, perhaps question that arises, how can we document retrospectively, uh, right, as well? But what interests me even more is, um, you know, there are all this um, actually uh, documentation of performances that ha that has not yet, yet happened, right? So for instance, and which you elaborated as well, uh, for instance, if Klein, uh, you know, leap into the void, um, which is purely constructed in the photographic space, and I wonder that uh, uh, you know you you uh, you argued that that um, performance needs not to have taken place in order to be real, right? As long as it is um, documented. And I wonder how the you know conservation uh, might play a role. How um, conservation of performance, uh, which not happened yet, um, can actually exist. Well, I actually think there are two different kinds of cases because for me, the Eve Klein leap is not a performance that didn't happen. It did happen, but it only happened in the space of the photograph, right? 
I mean, it also part of it also happened in real space, but uh, the what we see in the photograph all, takes place only in the photograph. So I don't consider that to be a performance that didn't happen. Okay, um, but on the other hand, there are performances that didn't happen. <laughs> um, the the I don't even know if this is really a performance, and I, I hope I have the facts correct about this, but I do remember when I saw the 11 Rooms exhibition in Manchester, there was a piece, I think it was by John Baldessari, which consisted of a series of documents about why he couldn't do an installation that involved a corpse. Um, so for me, that's a performance. If, if one wants to consider that to be a performance, I, you know, that's another question. But assuming that we can count that as a performance, that's a performance that didn't happen. OK. Um, and I mean, for me, there's always sort of a question of, I suppose, just trying to think about conservation, you know, sort of how far beyond documentation conservation has to go. And I think that's probably a very variable thing, right? So in the case of performances like the Eve Klein, where the performance takes place in the photograph, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how much more there is to do, you know, in a sense. Um, whereas, uh, the and, and something like the, the Baldessari thing, I don't know. I mean, that, that to me is a really interesting question, but I'm not sure. Uh, just what one is to do with that uh, on, on, you know, in a sense, on, on any level. I mean, I, I feel as if I don't have a really, well, I don't at all have a clearly worked out idea about this, but I sort of feel as if in a way that does work as a kind of performance documentation, because one can sort of envision the performance from it right as you can with any performance documentation even though for various reasons that performance couldn't take place um so um yeah i don't know i don't i really don't have really great answers <laughs> for these questions um but i guess you know i guess for me the the fundamental role uh, yeah, not speaking with any great expertise here, since I am not a conservator of any kind. Um, but 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 I just sort of imagining what I would think the role of the conservator would be would be to make the performance accessible to an audience in a way that sort of goes beyond what one can simply get from documentation. And so what that entails, I guess, it would be very variable according to the particular case and the particular circumstances. That's quite that's quite interesting uh, what what you just said um, because uh, well I mean it's it's all very interesting but uh, what I mean of course is that um, I have kind of a sneaky question <laughs> which is oh. that um, you say you're not a conservator uh, which of course you know professionally speaking you're not and you also say that you imagine that the conservation of performance would offer something that traditional documentation, which, you know, we understand generally to be photos or, or, or video, um, something that that can't offer. And so something that that I wonder, and this is really something that I asked myself also as an art historian, I don't have any training as a conservator, is whether um, art history, whether the writing about performance might also be a form of conservation, because, um, you know, as you say, you're, you're offering something that isn't available from the documentation. And that can be a personal experience of a performance that can be an analysis that can be another way that the performance lives on in the future. So I, I wonder if you've thought about any of your own writing uh, as a form of not necessarily conservation, but, but as having a, a, a conservational effect on the work you, you write about. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, partly because, um, and this, this may sound, <laughs> a little high-handed but um i <clears throat> for the most part this is not true for everything i write because i do write you know stuff about artists and their work and things like that on occasion uh but but most of the stuff i write and certainly the stuff for which i am best known um i see it much more as you know really kind of using performances particular performances as examples or as evidence in support of what I consider to be essentially philosophical arguments. Um, so I'm not really sure in a way, I mean, to me, uh, 
if I'm being very blunt about it, the performances are in a sense a means to an end. Um, it's so much about you know communicating them as it is about using them to communicate larger points or other points. Um, so, but you know, yeah, sure, maybe maybe along the way uh, in doing that by drawing attention to certain performances by uh, talking about them in a particular way. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe there, there is something of, of that kind going on, but I don't really, if I'm being honest about it, I don't really think of my, of most of my own work mm -hmm. um, in that kind of way. Yeah, and, that, and that's fair. And I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but I think um, it's worth pointing out that something that, that we find over and over again in our research is that conservation often, often happens kind of where you least expect it. And, and what you're saying now makes me wonder, well, you know, who says that exploiting a work of art isn't also a way of, of preserving it in a sense, you know, that you, you don't have to have kind of um, the, the sort of intentions you're referring to necessarily in order to contribute to the to the afterlife of the of the work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this also relates to something that I well, I've thought about this in, in other contexts, but I, it sort of occurred to me relatively recently that it's it's pretty relevant to this context as well, which is essentially the idea of canon formation uh, in the context of the history of performance art, because uh, I think that that even, you know, sort of begins um, with, uh, with the documentation itself, that a performance that's considered somehow to be important um, is more likely to be documented or thoroughly documented. I mean, this, 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 issue really first came to the fore for me when I was uh, writing about uh, Michael Kirby and his editorship of the Drama Review, because Kirby was very dedicated to, first of all, the idea of writing as a form of documentation, if not, let's say, preservation of performance. Um, he was much more interested in written documentation or description than he was in even in photographs. Um, and secondly, he was also very, very self-conscious about the idea that the purpose of this and his whole sort of editorial policy uh, was that the journal should publish written descriptions of performances as a way of preserving these performances for future audiences. And one of the uh, kind of quirks to this was his idea that um, it, in the future, this is a sort of utopian idea, that in the future there might be audiences who would actually understand these advanced performances better than we can now, right? Um, and so, so that he was kind of aiming for that future audience. But of course, you know, the, the twist of this is that that future audience was only going to have access to the performances that he was selecting now, right? Or somebody was selecting now for documentation for inclusion in the journal and i think the 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 can the, the formation of a canon really starts there with sort of the, the decision about which performances are worth documenting and worth you know making the effort to preserve that documentation or publish it in some fashion uh, or what have you and those performances that didn't make the cut you know, uh, I mean, the irony here is that Kirby couldn't possibly have known what the future audience would find interesting or understand, and yet he was making decisions about what was going to be available to that future audience, right? Um, and so I think that that's also, you know, a very um, important part of this, that in a sense, what we have most readily accessible to us now in terms of documented performances is, is the result of decisions that were made some time ago, right, um, about what performances are worth documenting and preserving and conserving. I mean, all of these things. Um, so I think that's, you know, I don't, I, 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 it's something I haven't talked a lot about recently, but I, I do think it's uh, ultimately, it's a pretty important issue in all of this. And speaking of canon building and um, future audiences, do you think that the way that audience is no more and more invo involved in creating documentation, I'm thinking especially of social media, how is that changing the canon or at least changing the way performance is transmitted and remembered for the future? I don't think, I mean, I'm just going to say this right offhand. I don't probably don't think that it has much to do with canon formation because, of course, for the most part, the people on YouTube are just documenting what they see. 
right? They go to a gallery or a museum or a show and they document that. So the existence of that or the presence of that performance in a museum or in a gallery or, or, or at a show, or whatever, um, has already been decided upon. So the, the canonical decisions have already been made. So I'm not sure. I mean, maybe over kind of a long term, um, as certain things become more exposed through social media uh, and more widely known as a result, that could have some influence uh, eventually on, on what's considered canonical. I think that's at least possible. Um, I do think, I do absolutely think that social media has changed uh, the process and nature of documentation. Um, in, in one sense, it's made it much more democratic. Uh, because we are now no longer confined to sort of the official record whatever of whatever kind. Um, uh, I mean, one of the examples I was uh, thinking of is um, I recently wrote a, a piece uh, on Rag Ragnar Kjartansson and uh, the sort of the focal piece in it, it's, it's a broader discussion of his work, but the focal piece in it was his uh, video installation, The Visitors. Um, and Actually, the best documentation of that piece, other than just seeing it, um, is a video on YouTube that someone who went to an exhibition of it shot. Um, and it's, it's a piece that takes about an hour, I would say, probably to really take in in its entirety. And this person did it <laughs> with, with the video camera. Uh, it's also a multi-screen installation. So you're getting a particular you know, perspective. But of course, you're always getting a particular perspective. So. Um, so, so this is, you know, in, in terms of, of my wanting to have some documentation on hand when I was writing my piece, this was actually the most useful thing there. And it was produced by some, you know, some unknown person or relatively unknown person uh, who just went in and did it. Um, and, you know, uh, sort of independent of whatever sort of more official kind of documentation um, Kjartan Zone himself or the museum or whoever might provide. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I definitely think that social media has cha is changing that landscape, at least in that way. Um, and I think there are certainly times when there can be sort of competing documentations or the official documentation and then in more informal documentation that people just produce from the things that they see. I mean, certainly in music, this is everywhere. Right. I mean, you can have uh, you can have official kind of con films of concerts or, or uh, re records of concerts. And then you also have people who are just in the crowd with their cell phone shooting the thing as well. Right. Um, and so so that increases, in a sense, the amount of documentation and it provides documentation from different perspectives, because as I've also written a little bit about, I think that frequently not not all the time, but frequently um audience is omitted from documentation uh, i think that there is still and i i don't i'm not absolutely critical of this because i think i understand it but i think there is still a kind of residual sense of the performance as a kind of artifact or artwork that, and that that's what needs to be uh documented or preserved not the audience's engagement with it necessarily, which is, you know, contingent and just for that particular iteration of the performance, you know, et cetera. Um, and I do understand that. I mean, I understand the, the, you know, the impulse to try to make the work available, which I do think is the primary function of documentation. Nevertheless, you know, uh, if we do think of performances as uh, social interactions, then the other side of that interaction is the audience. Um, and unless it's a performance that's really structured to engage the audience directly, usually what's happening there is, is not included in official documentation, but often is included in sort of less formal kinds of documentation that people just make themselves. So that gives us another kind of ground level perspective on the performance that may not um, in other kinds of documentation. So I think I think all of this is good. <laughs> and I think it, it's, it's, it is generating a lot more information and taking, you know, somewhat diminishing the power of institutions like galleries and museums to control this process of the documentation and dissemination of information. Um, um, the only the only downside for me, well, two downsides. I mean, one is that it also takes control out of the hands of the artists. Uh, to some degree, right? Because artists may have a very strong interest in controlling uh, 
the way in which their work is disseminated. Um, and that is very, had become very, very difficult in the age of social media. Uh, the other downside is just how chaotic this is. I, and this is something I actually wrote about a while ago and thinking about YouTube as a kind of uh, archive, which I do believe it is, but it's a completely chaotic, disorganized, um, you know, an undependable um, uh, kind of archive, which somewhat limits its value, I think, to, to my mind. I mean, nothing is more frustrating than, you know, seeing a video and then trying to go back to it later and finding that you can't, you know, it's not there anymore. Um, uh, so that's not a very good archive, but it is an archive nevertheless. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm i very curious, um, Philippe, to hear your thoughts um, about um, the facts, the, uh, this aspect of um, uh, photographic documentation that actually, I mean, let me put it this way. If we take a photograph of a performance, we perhaps document a particular instance of a performance, but not the performance itself, right? So there must be, um, I think, some kind of, um, yeah, larger universe to this when we when we claim that we want to wanna document performance. It, it must be more than just one or two, two snapshots. And I, and I wonder, how is ontology not relevant there? And you remember that I, I'm insisting on kind of on this question of ontology and you are saying to us back, we were blessed to have you, you know, of just with us. And this is just a continuation of our conversations that we started last year. You said that ontology is not really relevant. And, you know, as someone who involved the chapters on against ontology in your three, um, three uh, times. different editions, yes, of, of your seminal book, right? But I still, I, if I may just kind of, you know, slightly stay on this uh, on this um, aspect for a little bit, how is ontology irrelevant um, then? I mean, if we talk about iterations and a work as a whole, and perhaps that takes us back also to the question of the artwork, you know, or art objects as something different from a particular performance um, from this morning. Um, yeah, perhaps you could just um, speak a little bit to this. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely understand this, this sort of around, I mean, this is what I term the iconic image um, and the way in which, you know, particular performances especially are really, they, they're, their continued existence is as like one picture, right? Um, and that's the, the, that's the thing that from which most people who know about it uh, know about it, unless you really, you know, are, are engaged in more expert level research into it. Um, and I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm ambivalent about this because I don't, I don't think it's entirely a bad thing in a way. Uh, I completely uh, acknowledge that it's, you know, it is a sort of misrepresentation of an event that took a certain amount of time and you know, involved many things, presumably, or more things, um, and then it's, it's being sort of reduced to this one image, right? Um, but, um, but first of all, the one image contains more information than it's often acknowledged. Uh, I have also written about the idea that still photographs are not, in fact, still. Uh, and this is not my idea alone. This is something that many people have taken up. Um, that, you know, the still, the still image always implies what came before and what came after. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's not as static as uh, is often thought. Uh, I also, uh, a long time ago, when I was running around doing lectures on various things, I did a sort of experiment with my audiences um, where I showed them a picture, a still image, a very striking one from one of Robert Whitman's happenings. I think it was American Moon. Um, and then I showed them a film of the same moment in the performance. And I have to say, by and large, the audiences really didn't feel as if they were getting more information from the moving image than they got from the still image, right? Um, and I, I can't, I don't have an account of this. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I may not have, I may not be qualified in a sense to try to talk about why this might be. Um, but I'm not completely prepared to just dismiss, you know, sort of the still image or the single image or non-time-based documentation of time-based things as necessarily an ontological betrayal of the event. 
um, because I think there's more going on there than uh, in terms of, of how still images actually function for us um, than uh, it, it, we, we acknowledge when we talk about this. But I also don't feel entirely qualified to speculate on exactly what's going on there. Um, because I mean, I mean, um, I um, ended up writing, yeah, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, I did end up writing a little bit more about this. We're just looking into it a little bit more. And, you know, one of the things I found out about, and I don't remember who this was, but I read an account of a filmmaker uh, who would use, you know, sort of one image to signify each scene or whatever in the film. Not one image for the whole film, but one image for each kind of significant moment uh, for, uh, in the film. And, and so I think, you know, again, I think the, the, the still image may have more power or may tell us more about what's going on than simply saying, well, it's, you know, it's an isolated moment from a larger thing, or it's, you know, it's static as opposed to active or fluid, uh, whereas the event itself is, yeah, et cetera. So I don't know. I just think there's a little bit more to be unpacked there. Thank you. So I have um, another type of question for you, <laughs> Phil. Um, and this is not, not something that we've talked with you about previously. So you are yourself also a performer. You have a good deal of experience uh, as a screen actor. Uh, and I'm curious as to how that, and, and of course you're involved in, in music as well in, in many ways, which you also write about uh, in, in um, you know, many different kinds of music. Um, so I'm wondering about how your own experiences as a performer have informed your ideas about performance. Um. You know, it's an interesting question, <laughs> um, partly because in some ways I actually consciously try to bracket those two aspects of my life, um, uh, because in a way, the pleasure of performing is not to theorize what you do uh, for me. So there are ways in which I actually want to keep that sort of cordoned off from uh, uh, my scholarship. Now, that said, one thing that I have absolutely found to be true, and one real value of being a performer of a kind who writes about performance, um, is that, uh, this is not something I, I do all the time, but, you know, occasionally, is that if I am in a position of interviewing someone, a performer, or, you know, for, for that sort of thing, even if, I mean, I'm an actor, you know, I interview musicians, et cetera. So it's not the same kind of performance, but I think just having had the experience of doing it uh, creates a kind of common ground um, to talk to other people who do it. Um, so I think that's been actually incredibly valuable to me. The other thing I will mention is that when I was in college studying art history, um, my mentor, uh, said to me, you know, have you ever taken a course over in fine arts? And I said, no. He said, well, here you're studying the stuff. Don't you think you should have experience of making it? Right. Um, and so I thought, okay. <laughs> I went over, I took it, and I actually became pretty good at drawing, although it turns out drawing is something you have to keep doing if you want to stay good at it. Um, and, you know, and I can't say exactly what you know, the kind of hands-on aspect of it did or what it brought to my understanding, but it brought something, right? I mean, I, I absolutely do believe that having the kind of firsthand experience of doing something informs your way of thinking about it, but I don't know that it's, it's I've never really been able to, or really in a sense wanted to, uh, kind of codify exactly how that works, right? Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, but I mean, and I bring this into my teaching as well. I mean, I, I teach a basic course in performance studies in which the students have to perform. You know, I teach courses in the history of music where the students have to sing. Um, yeah, because I just think it's it, it definitely brings a whole different sense of what's going on if you if you do it yourself. Uh, I mean, I'm teaching a course now, which is a kind of performance analysis sort of course. Uh, where we're looking at a, a range of performance. I keep telling the students, you know, uh, 
if you're looking at a gesture, make the gesture yourself, see how it actually feels, right? Um, to do it. Um, and, and I do this also uh, when I'm looking at certain kinds of things. So yeah, I mean, I actually, I, I definitely think that this kind of experiential and bodily engagement with the, in some way, you know, even if it's relatively indirect with the thing that you're talking about, um, definitely aids in comprehension. But again, exactly how it does that um, I don't know. The other thing I will also say about it is that, um, and I think they're probably, if, I, if I'm if i trying to be brutally honest about it, there probably is some kind of connection here, which is that, I mean, I, I have been both a stage actor and a film actor. And um, one thing I've noticed about my life as a film actor is that when I'm performing on camera, I have no conception of audience whatsoever. I have no sense that I am performing for anyone, even though, of course, ultimately there is to be an audience, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Um, but it's, it's just not part of the equation uh, when I'm actually doing it. And I find that to be interesting. And I think it pro probably in some way that has crept into some of my thinking about the uh, significance of the presence or absence of audiences um, in uh, performance and performance documentation. Great. I I also, you know, I was very curious um, hearing about the abundance of different forms, you know, in which uh, performance inheres or leaves different mm. forms of documentation, but also, you know, generally in leftovers, props and, and um, paraphernalia and, and relics, uh, uh, all the subjects and scores, obviously, you know, memory and so on. I wonder, um, do you think, is there, given this abundance, you know, um, of things, um, do, do, can you envision, you know, a performance which completely disappears or so, or is there no such a thing that, you know, that performance can kind of vanish entirely? Or be not preserved at all. You know, is it is it like is there some kind of automatisms that that happens just because you know there is this form of performance that itself is uh, so viral in a way, just to use Christopher I think Bedford's um, notion. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be glib at first here and just say that how would we know if this had happened? Right. I mean, if a performance left nothing behind, we wouldn't even know it had occurred. Say so for so, certain groups, no, like for, for no, a group at all. Of, I mean, yes. at all. It just wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't we wouldn't even be able to say, oh, here's an example of that. Mm -hmm. right? Here's an example of a performance that has disappeared. We can't do that because if it's disappeared, we don't know about it. All right. So that's one thing. <laughs> now, there certainly are performances that have left behind minimal traces right uh, or performances that some people remember but are very hard to find any other form of documentation so in that sense i i would agree that it's it is impossible uh for a performance to disappear completely um but with the caveat that if that has happened we wouldn't know about it right uh so it's impossible to talk about that that prospect because if we know about it, it left something behind. You know, we, if it's you know just a hint of something, a trace of memory, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one review in a, in a magazine, or you know, whatever it might be, there's something there that allows us to say, oh, we know very little about this, right? Or, or oh, this has you know essentially disappeared, but it hasn't because we know about it. So I think that's the paradox there that you can't really talk about. You can't really ask the question, is yes. it possible for the performance to disappear entirely? Because we can't talk about any examples of performances that disappeared entirely. No, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> absolutely, I agree. I mean, one can see it diachronically you now and in historical periods that are perhaps then rediscovered and we reconnect with them. But, but you're absolutely right. that If we say that a performance disappears, then it already is there in a way, right? Yeah. Because we know that it's not there. <laughs> thank you, thank you.
So we have a question from Aga. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the issue of authorship of performance documentation. When the documentation represents a performance on display, uh, especially for historical performances, it is often shown under the name of the performer, not under the name of the author of this photograph or video recording. Um, right. And she adds that she has a sense that this tendency is, is, has been changing recently. Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably true. And I, I'm not um this is something I've I've noticed and I've sort of thought a little bit about. I mean, again, certain especially with um performance uh historical, more historical examples. Um, where I mean, because there were, you know, like for example, in New York in the early 60s, there were uh photographers who you know, were sort of whose careers were built around photographing art performances. Um, and then there certainly were people, Peter Moore being one of them, Babette Mangold being another, who were sort of go-to photographers at certain points in the Peter Moore more in the 60s, Babette Mangold more in the 70s, um, for performers who wanted their work uh, to be photographed. Um, and I think this is, you know, I think this, I think what this basically speaks to once again is sort of the way in which performance has been assimilated to the idea of the art object, right? As it's become, I mean, even I was gonna say as it's become more institutionalized, but that isn't really correct. I mean, even before that, even before this sort of wave of the institutionalization of performance art or this interest in performance that museums have been taking, um, which is relatively recent, well before that, uh, you know, artists whose work was documented, uh, it, the, it was sort of uh, the implication was that the identity of the photographer of a performance was no more important than the identity of the photographer who takes pictures of paintings or sculptures for museum catalogs, you know, things like that. It was a sort of the same thing uh, that what we're what we're after here, the, the, or rather the, the thing that's important is the work and, and the, the author of the work. Right. Um, but. Uh, I think there certainly have been things more recently. I mean, uh, Babette Mangold herself has been quite active in this uh, in more recent years of staging exhibitions, using her uh, performance photography as sort of the material of her own work, right? Um, and kind of asserting her, I mean, this is not just what the, those exhibitions are about, but it does have the effect of sort of asserting her authorship of this material. Um, and her ability to to use it in ways other than uh, were originally uh, intended. And I would use it in ways that, in a sense, go beyond um, its function or uh, as documentation of a performance. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't have a, a, a lot. Of, I don't have anything real cl clear to say about this. But I certainly uh, that sort of effacement of, of the photographer or the videographer or whoever. Uh, is something that um, I've taken note of, and um, and and yeah, maybe it is. Uh, maybe that is starting to change. I, I I mean, I'm not completely convinced of that, but I'm, I can certainly think of examples where the identity of that person is asserted uh, much more than in the past. Thank you so much, uh, Philippe. That was really amazing, and yeah, um, thank so you so rich. much.